Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Uh, Y'all, uh, it is Thanksgiving as I am recording this episode, and uh, I have put my little turkeys to bed, uh, so to speak, and um, now I'm just going to be saying some words about all this stuff and then uh, popping this out into the world. Uh, for those of you who are in the States and, and celebrate Thanksgiving, I hope it was a good one. I had an absolutely wonderful time, basically been celebrating for a week, and that week has included a lot of turkey, a lot of mashed potatoes, a lot of apple pie, and a lot of pumpkin pie. So uh, no complaints on this end. And uh, as as most of you know, um, the day after this episode drops is affectionately known as Black Friday. It is the day where a lot of people start their holiday shopping. And uh, the name comes from the fact that it makes um, people have very uh, negative feelings if they work in the retail world. So let's be kind to those people when we're out there. I know everyone in my audience is, but just a friendly reminder. Um, and and I did want to tell y'all that if you are in any kind of decorating or gift giving world uh this year uh go to target go to target where they have two things i think you will be interested in um first of all they have a whole bunch of animal ornaments available at target and also they have partnered with FAO Schwartz to uh, have a line of stuffed animals there that are really, really adorable, y'all. These are just the cutest. Um, and yes, in case you are wondering, there is both a red panda ornament and an absolutely adorable plush red panda as part of the FAO Schwartz line. He's uh, very floppy. He lays down. He has a very cute face. And uh, yes, I already have both. And uh, my, my stuffed friend is named Floppy Joe, like a sloppy Joe. But he's not sloppy. He's just really, really floppy, y'all. So one of the things that I am thankful for is the fact that red pandas seem to be getting out there into the collective consciousness more and more, which not only makes it, you know, really easy for me to buy more red panda stuff, because we all know if there's one thing John Rossi needs, it's more red panda stuff. But it also means that um, at the end of the day, more people are going to be aware of this cute animal and then learn about it and then hopefully get into conservation. And then much as we saw with the giant pandas, hopefully we can save red pandas. So um, basically what I'm telling you is go to Target, buy a $5 ornament and a $15 stuffed animal, and you may end up helping save red pandas. Uh, this is not a paid advertisement by Target, though I really wish it was. Um, as a side note, in case you're wondering how nerdy I am, I, I am not kidding when I tell you this. Every single time I go to Target, I now go to the toy aisle and I go to where the FAO Schwartz stuffed animals are and I uh, find the red pandas and I set them up so they are looking super cute and looking right out, making eye contact with people. I am helping those pandas find forever homes. Yeah, I know. I'm a nerd. I am aware. <laughs> hey, if you listen to this thing, so are you. I have one other thing that I want to talk about before we get to our Zoo News stuff, um, which is, as you may have seen on my socials, uh, I am now collaborating with LE Artisan Studio and our friends at Penguins International 
uh, they're they're doing a contest together. And as a brand ambassador for the artist, I'm helping promote it. And uh, you can win some uh, really cool penguin stickers and even an incredible like sweatshirt with all of the different types of penguins of the world on it. Uh, I put up a little advertisement for the contest today. Might have a special cameo by a certain son of mine, possibly the one named Miles is that's the only one that I have. Um, and I highly recommend you check it out. And I highly recommend that you start sharing and liking and doing all the things that you have to do. You can find uh, the information in my stories on socials or go to at penguins underscore international to find more information. And uh, it's a great contest. It is an awesome opportunity to raise money for penguins and also get some cool penguin swag for yourself. So 10 out of 10. Love this. Highly recommend that you check it out. And that brings us to All right, so we're going to start it off like we usually do, discussing some really cool births. And uh, the first one I'm particularly excited about the Kansas City Zoo has announced the birth of a baby tree kangaroo, a tree kangaroo joey, or as we like to say on here, a tree kanglet. The little pouch potato is still hanging out in mum's pouch, but thanks to incredible training that allows for pouch checks, you can see her face now by going to their social media pages. Uh, as a fun side note, the mom is named Nokopo and is actually the sister of LaRue, one of the tree kangaroos you all have gotten to see on my socials and hear about on my episode with Mac from Roger Williams Park Zoo. 16 Solomon Island leaf froglets have hatched at Point Defiance Zoo. This is one of the few frog species out there that actually hatches as a frog, not as a tadpole. They are still born super small, though, uh, around the size of a chocolate chip, but they are fully formed frogs, just little tiny frogs that you could put a whole bunch of into a cookie. Not, not that anyone wants to make, like, frog cookies, but... You get the point. Anyway, uh, Solomon Island leaf froglets uh, and frogs in general are a really cool species, and uh, this is really exciting news. Speaking of acute species and exciting news, Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo has announced the birth of a male tufted deer. Now, mom and baby will bond behind the scenes for a while, but they should start to make appearances on exhibit before the holiday season is over. So if you want to go and uh, check out a tiny little baby deer, you can do that before Christmas, Hanukkah, etc. have all wrapped up. And uh, hey, let's talk about tigers for a bit. So Zoo Miami has announced the birth of a female Sumatran tiger cub, or tiglet, which was actually born all the way back on September 6th, uh, but which still remains unnamed. Now, this is an especially special birth for the zoo, as the cub's father, Biryani, has passed away uh, just earlier this month, actually, from cancer. So uh, while that was a sad loss, it's really nice that this tiger's legacy will get to live on in this newly born offspring. And speaking of tiglets, the St. Louis Zoo has announced the birth of three Amur tiger cubs earlier this month. Now, Amur tigers are an incredibly endangered species, so every birth is a huge milestone. Um, they're also just really cute and really cool tigers. So uh, yeah, congrats to the team at the St. Louis Zoo. And then finally this week in our births section... Our friends at Wildlife World Zoo in Arizona have announced the birth of a female white rhino calf born earlier this month. Now, this rhinelet is named Masiki, though the staff call her Siki for short. Masiki actually means ears, and she was given this name because she was a challenge to track by ultrasound because her ears kept getting in the way. And those ears were also one of the first things she moved upon being born. 
So this adorable birth also represents the first time that a rhino has been born in Arizona in literally decades. So congrats to the team at Wildlife World Zoo for this incredibly special, incredibly important birth. And sadly, that does lead us to our deaths section. And we're going to start off uh, with, a, with a pretty big one, y'all. The Cincinnati Zoo has announced a devastating loss. Amali, a three-year-old bonobo. Now, what happened is the bonobo troop at the zoo came down with respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV. This is a disease that is common amongst all primates, including humans, where it can be fatal, especially in infants and the elderly. Despite the fact that it can be deadly, most people and non-human primates do survive the disease. In fact, it's so prevalent that it is believed that most children have been infected with the virus by the time they are two years old. Now, I have the privilege of being connected to multiple people on the primate team through the podcast, and to say they are brokenhearted is an understatement. Watching this little girl grow up has meant so much to the team who just adored her. Also, I'm a member of the Cincinnati Zoo member page on Facebook, as I am a member of the zoo, and I don't think I've ever seen such an outpouring of love and sorrow and just a sharing of photos and such as I have for this poor little girl. Uh, it seems like everyone, even slightly related to the Cincinnati Zoo, is just, just devastated. So I am sending all the love and respect to the entire care team at the zoo and, and to all of Amali's fans as they go through this incredibly challenging time. And speaking of challenging losses, the Denver Zoo has announced the passing of an 11-year-old African lion named Sabi. Sabi, or Princess Sabi, as she was known by her team, was a very special girl who was born, along with her two brothers, to the royal family of Qatar. After four months, the family realized they didn't have the expertise to properly care for pet lions and contacted the IUCN, who worked with the AZA SSP. Side note, we have way too many uh, acronyms in this industry, um, to take the three lions to the Denver Zoo. The lions were hand-reared at the zoo, and from the time they arrived, they faced numerous medical issues, most likely caused by the conditions they lived in before arriving in Denver. In fact, shortly after their arrival, their mother passed away, so they, they really weren't in the best conditions. Now, the zoo, of course, gave all three lions an incredible second chance at a great life, and the two boys left to head to other zoos for breeding wrecks, but Sabi stayed in Denver for the remainder of her life. As it became clear that Sabi's medical issues were too much for her to have any quality of life, um, team members were able to go and say goodbye to their favorite princess. Sending condolences to everyone at the Denver Zoo for this, this very sad loss, but also what an incredible story, and I am just so grateful that the zoo and this team was there to be able to give her the life that she deserved. And our last death this week comes from the Great Plains Zoo, which has announced the passing of Charles the Black Bear. Charles was 24 years old and was known for his sweet and gentle nature. In fact, peafowl would often hang out in his exhibit, including their babies, because Charles would just watch them with great interest, but never interfere. The staff there absolutely loved him, as did a lot of the members, and uh, it's safe to say that Charles will be greatly missed. And uh, now we move on to our normal zoo news, and um, I, I hate to change the tone so drastically because we are mourning those losses, but y'all, the next couple of stories have me really excited, okay? So... Right off the bat, we're going to start off by saying that Squirt is here. Squirt is here. I'm so excited. Are you excited? Oh, I, I should probably tell you who Squirt is. Okay, so Squirt is a rescued, non-releasable Kemp's Ridley sea turtle who has finally arrived at his new home at Aquarium of Niagara. Now, 
I've actually known Squirt was coming for quite a while and happened to be there one of the first days he was visible before the aquarium announced. It has been so hard for me to sit on this, y'all, because I was so excited. Who am I getting? I'm still so excited. You can, you can hear that. You're listening to me being excited. Um, I actually shared some of the photos I took of Squirt when I first saw him um, with the aquarium staff, and they used one of them as the first photo on their official announcement, which obviously meant the world to me. But um, even going further than that, I've actually known Squirt for a while now, as he came from our friends at Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota, Florida. I have visited Squirt multiple times at that facility, and now I get to keep visiting him at Aquarium of Niagara. And uh, I, not to keep rehashing this, but I am just so, so excited. Uh, the aquarium is currently selling a limited edition commemorative shirt to celebrate or shell a bright squirts arrival. So make sure you check that out on their socials and get a shirt celebrating the coolest sea turtle around. And then moving right from that to another super exciting announcement. Our good friends at the Lehigh Valley Zoo have announced that they will be getting a new species in 2024. Red pandas, y'all. They will be building a brand new exhibit to welcome the best species of all the species, and they are actually asking for help in financing the new habitat. And so now I'm asking you to help me help them fund the habitat. Okay, in case you haven't seen this on my socials, let me explain. So normally, this is the time where I give you a direct link to donate to a cause if you're interested. But the zoo is doing something pretty cool. If you donate $500 or more, they will put your name on a plaque on the exhibit. Y'all, I really want to have a red panda habitat with raw safari on it. It would not only be great advertising, but would also mean a lot to me personally to know that our community was able to come together to help the zoo raise that much money or more. Can we do more? Let, let's do more. Uh, to support the zoo and get on that plaque. So I'll be uh, posting links uh, to a GoFundMe in my stories and other places, and you can help me help the Lehigh Valley Zoo create an incredible red panda habitat. Also, I'm willing to bet they'd be very happy to do an episode all about the new pandas and the exhibit if we help fund it. So what do you say? Help me put the panda in Panda Sylvania? Yeah, that worked. That totally worked. Everybody, you're all nodding your heads and saying that worked, right? Uh, yeah. So again, link is on my socials. Link is in the show notes. And whether we hit that goal or not, I am so excited for the Lehigh Valley Zoo to get red pandas and will be so grateful for any money our community is able to raise towards this goal. And, you know, I kind of want to take a second to explain that, like, getting red pandas into a zoo, if you're a person who might not be able to make it to that zoo, but you love red pandas, is actually still a really beneficial thing. You may remember back in the episode with Sarah Glass, who is the coordinator of the Red Panda SSP program, she talked about the fact that the more facilities that have an animal, the more breeding wrecks are able to go out. Because one thing we need to do is make sure that we have room for all of the animals that are, you know, in the population. So any time that a zoo decides to welcome red pandas is a win for the overall red panda population. It means more panda cubs. It means more cute photos of red panda cubs. It means more chances to get another amazing, adorable, spunky animal like Bandit or just the cutest, sweetest girl like Miso into the population. So uh, if you are able, please, please, please contribute. Please help me help this zoo help red pandas. You know, the Oakland Zoo keeps impressing me with the work they do for the local wildlife in California. I talked about their cougar rescue and rehabilitation work they do last week, um, and this week I get to share another cool story. 
One of the hospital keepers at the zoo, who is named Nikki, recently went out into the wild with the team at Pinnacles National Park to do health checks on three California condors before they start laying eggs for the season. The heart that the keepers at the Oakland Zoo have for native wildlife is just so beautiful to me, and um, I'm just I'm just constantly so proud of that zoo. And let's be honest. It's not just the Oakland Zoo that sends keepers out into the wild, be it local or not. Uh, Zoo New England recently had one of their keepers named Bridget join the Snow Leopard Trust out in the Tost Mountains in Mongolia to help with snow leopard conservation efforts, including setting up camera traps. She got some incredible photos from the traps, which you can see by visiting at Zoo New England on the socials. All right, time for uh, an update story. So you may remember that earlier this year, we talked about the fact that a giraffe at Seneca Park Zoo named Capenzi has been diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma on her jaw. The zoo recently shared a surprising update about Capenzi that I wanted to share with all of you. The tumor has continued to grow slowly, but Capenzi is still eating and functioning extremely well as she receives her cutting-edge treatment. Uh, But there is more. Capenzi is pregnant. It is believed that the calf, or giraffelet as I like to say, will appear later this winter. Now, It is worth mentioning that giraffe births are always considered high risk, and Capenzi having medical issues only makes this one more so. But it's an absolutely incredible thing to be able to share that she is pregnant even as she goes through this medical issue. I'm going to stay optimistic for just every part of this story and just be excited for all involved talk about the incredible medical treatment provided at zoos like that is beyond astonishing and uh you know as we're we're doing a couple of updates here if you've been following zoo news for a while now you know that prospect park zoo in new york city is currently closed to the public after taking some serious damage from a tropical storm Well, the social media team at the zoo knows that fans are missing the animals there, so they have decided to start a series of posts known as Updates from Prospect Park Zoo, showing what the animals are up to during the closure. The first one is now posted. I love that they are doing this and hope that both fans of the zoo and the ever-growing global zoo fan movement all tune in and get to know and love these animals and then head to the zoo to celebrate them when it eventually reopens. Okay, so... I, I don't usually announce animal names on here anymore, but this one is too good not to share. Uh, We recently talked about a rhino birth at the Virginia Zoo, and the team has announced that she is named Letty. Now, you might be confused by why I'm so excited about that, but uh, I will tell you. Letty's name is inspired by Sergeant Nakateko Letty Mazimba, a ranger with the Black Mambas, the first all-female anti-poaching organization in South Africa who was recently named the best field ranger in all of Africa for her passionate efforts to protect rhinos and educate local communities about conservation. I love it. All right, and then we're going to wrap up Zoo News with a couple of quick hits about panda bears. So while much of the discussion in the U.S. press about panda bears has been about how China has not been renewing the panda leases at zoos in the States, the truth is that has been the case the world over. Edinburgh Zoo has announced that there is only a little more than a week left to say goodbye to their panda bears before they head back to China. Fans in the UK have been trying to figure out the best ways to say goodbye and have been vocally upset about the bears leaving, just like we saw recently at the National Zoo in the United States. Luckily, there is hope that the program will start up again soon, as we discussed last week. And 
speaking of that, I, I mentioned last week that the president of China mentioned that panda bears will be coming back to the United States. Well, if SNL parodies are your thing, uh, the cold open this past week dealt with uh, Joe Biden and panda bears and all that stuff. Um, also, friendly reminder to newer listeners, I was on SNL once. Cool story, huh? Stereotypical animal podcast theme song. Here to bring you to conservation news. All right, and that brings us to conservation news. So we've all heard about the California wildfires that seem to happen every year, ripping a path of destruction through parts of the state and wiping out large numbers of animals in the process, as well as destroying their habitat. Well, a recent study has shown that there has been so much habitat and prey degradation that many species are actually shifting their survival strategies, both short and long term, in order to try to be prepared for the eventual and seemingly endless next fires. Now, moving away from their standard habitat and finding new prey items are two examples of ways that animals are changing their behaviors at both individual and species-wide levels within the affected areas. Just the, the latest example of how, you know, human stuff causes animals to have to figure out how to live life on, uh, you know, their planet. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the big threats to wildlife around the globe that people don't often consider are dogs and cats. Now, we've talked about this before in a variety of ways. Pet cats that are allowed outside, as well as feral cat populations that are allowed to thrive, are devastating to the animals that live in their area. Uh, Red Panda Network does a lot of work to vaccinate dogs in Nepal to avoid them giving rabies to red pandas. This is just a constant battle the world over. And it turns out that the island of Madagascar is no exception. Uh, but now an American NGO called the Mad Dog Initiative is stepping in to run sterilization and rabies vaccination campaigns. Now, while the campaigns are a great start, the group admits there are some big issues to overcome in the area. One problem is just making villagers aware of the issue. Uh, it's, it's hard to convince very poor dog owners to spend money taking care of their pets. It's a challenge. Medicine costs money. Getting medicine to Madagascar costs more money. Another problem is overcoming uh, fadies, which is a Malagasy term that uh, roughly translates to taboos. In this case, there are many villages in which people feel they cannot work with dogs. It would just be against like what they do as a culture. And in some villages, they actually believe it is taboo to even have any kind of direct interaction with a dog. Now, for starters, that just makes me really sad for those people because direct interaction with a dog is one of my favorite types of interaction with anything. Dogs are awesome. But then it also makes it really hard to convince those people to go against their cultural norms to interact with a dog, to vaccinate it, um, to spay and neuter, uh, the, the dogs in the area, um, and to do the, the things that we just, we need to do to stop them from, you know, having just horrible effects on the native wildlife of Madagascar. And then last but not least in conservation news this week, there is some great news out of New Guinea. The wild singing dog population in New Guinea has been thought to be extinct for many decades, with the last confirmed sighting coming in the 1970s. Now, it turns out that some dogs that were believed to be another species have been found and tested, and it turns out they are almost genetically identical to New Guinea singing dog DNA that we have in the zoo-based population. 
So it turns out that the singing dogs have been singing this whole time, and we just haven't been listening. Yeah? Was that, was that pretty creative? No? Okay. Anyway, uh, with only 15 of these dogs currently known to be around in the wild, this is a happy story with a major caveat. The wild population isn't extinct, as has been believed for a long time, but that doesn't mean that the population will not go extinct if we don't do everything in our power to save them very soon. It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, right now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park on other news. All right. And uh, speaking of canines in the, the last segment, but in a slightly different way, um, a mysterious illness has been affecting canines, including pet dogs lately. It is a highly contagious respiratory illness, which is often presenting with coughing, sneezing, nasal and eye discharge, fever, and signs of lethargy. Experts aren't sure exactly what is going on, but uh, the disease can be fatal, and so it is recommended to make sure that your dog is up to date on vaccinations, and uh, it's also recommended that you avoid the dog park and, in general, keep your dog away from other dogs, especially if either dog is showing any symptoms that could be related to this terrible uh, new disease. Hopefully, we'll get some more good news about this soon as we figure out what it is. But for now, uh, let's just be extra safe with our our dogs because uh, losing them is very sad. Uh, and then on a much, 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 much happier note, roughly two years ago on this podcast, it was my pleasure to announce the birth of Danny and Paul Larson's daughter, Raina. Well... Raina is now two years old, because that's how time works. Or at the very least, that's how humans perceive it. But that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, Raina also happens to love lemurs, which is why Danny and Paul did an incredible thing at her birthday party. The bird team from Southwick's Zoo brought an amazing bird named Ernie, who if you've listened to those Southwick's episodes, you've heard a lot about and even heard from. Um, and they used a trained behavior where Ernie collected donations for our friends at the Lemur Conservation Foundation. In total, they raised $168. And Reyna was so excited to help save the lemurs. I am so proud of this whole family, including their dog, Shine, who was not featured in this story, but is just an amazing dog. Happy birthday, Reyna. So proud of you. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right, and that brings us to our animal holidays for the week. Uh, so a quick reminder that November is Manatee Awareness Month, and then we get to our individual days. Now, I'd like to point out that this week has seven days in it, just like most weeks do. Possibly all weeks? Meh. Hard to say. Anyway, there are only two days with animal holidays on them this week, but there are also five animal holidays. Uh, more people need to invest in the Peppermint Narwhal Animal Holidays calendar and then figure out where to move these days around. But anyway, your animal holidays for the week are November 24th is Walrus Day and Evolution Day. And then November 29th is International Jaguar Day, World Anteater Day, and World Tamandua Day. Which, like, to be fair, a Tamandua is a type of anteater, so I guess them sharing days makes sense. Or does it, since it also means they get, like, two days, but on the same day, so it's, it's just, just, like, one day... I don't know, man. Days are confusing. All I know is that time is an illusion and lunchtime doubly so. 
That is a quote from Douglas Adams that I love. And those are your animal holidays for the week. All right. So there you have it, folks. Uh, Another week of Rasafari Zoo News is in the books. And uh, the next time that y'all are listening to a Zoo News episode, we're going to start talking about animal holidays in December, the last month of the year. I don't know about y'all, but uh, it feels like this one has really flown by. I would like to say thank you uh, to all of my patrons for being here and supporting the pod, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Lara Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, and Barbara Bennett. And I would also like to thank everybody who contributed a Zoo News story to me this week. Uh, And don't forget that if you would like to contribute to Zoo News and have your name featured in the section, you can do so by tagging me in things at Rossafari on socials or at Rossafari Pod on the TikTok machine, or by emailing me stories to RossafariPod at gmail.com. So thank you for contributing this week. Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley Croninger, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Emily Rockbuck, Sue Isbell, Dr. Laura Shank, Sam Evans, Kay Malensky, Ali Malensky, the Malensky. Boom, 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 boo, doo, 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 boom. Amanda Berg, Marianne Rossi, Barbara Bennett, Nancy Fetters, Emily Poche, Dylan Hoy, Jay Meredith, and Sam Stock. And one more reminder, help me help the Lehigh Valley Zoo get their red panda habitat going. Go check my socials. Go check my stories. Give if you can. Share if you can't give. Do all the things. Let's get a new zoo some red pandas. Whether you're part of that or not, you're welcome back here on Tuesday for my interview episode and next Friday for the next Zoo News. And remember, friends, the words newsy credits backwards are Steider Yuswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.